So there's some people who don't know what ZFS is. Um, can I have a show of hands in chat? So if you're, you're, if you're used to computers, chances are you're used to a boot disk and maybe a, a separate hard disk for home or something like that. If you're adventurous, you've probably installed CentOS or something and got an LVM um, that's kind of like a high-powered um, partition manager. And I didn't do a lot of artwork in this, so this is just a, a, a general overview. So if, if you're familiar with RAID, all right, RAID, RAID is a way of taking multiple disks and presenting them as a unified volume. Right, but but RAID's kind of limited in that it's only for redundancy. Um, I guess there's RAID zero and all that, but but it's fairly limited. So Sun and Sun Microsystems came up with ZFS, and it's sort of like an amalgam of all of the better ideas in storage. Right, so ZFS can take multiple disks and and form basically a pool and out of that pool you can create uh logical disks or LUNs that look like hard disks so for instance on my machine my my system i use a, a zfsc pool and i have a whole bunch of LUNs created. These are called ZVOLs. A ZVOL is uh, a Linux device that looks like a disk, feels like a disk, acts like a disk, but it's allocated out of the Z pool. All right. So if you look at these are all these are all these various disks that I use for virtual machines in my system, right? So we've got um, a CentOS 6 GUI, uh, which goes to ZD16, and you see part one and part two. Those That's the boot and whatever. So if we look at, oh, I didn't do it on that one. Okay, that's funny. Right, so that's the that's the FS Z balls. Uh, I'll I'll get into more in, in a minute, but the idea is to have basically a RAID array of on this system six disks, um, logs. I'm not going to get into too many details here because if you want if we want to do a an in depth discussion about ZFS, uh, that could be a long presentation and, and kind of fun if you want to get into it. But right now we're going to talk about high level user space usage of it. So it's basically a, uh, a system that can concatenate and manage multiple disks and allow you to control how it's used, how it's allocated. Uh, it helps you replicate it can take point in time snapshots where you can basically say, this data is something I want to save. So you snapshot it and that'll never change. And you can always have it. Let's go to the first slide. So before we start going down, let's talk about some basic conventions. Disks, disks are, are, are these things, right? That's a disk. A LUN is a logical unit that is created by uh, a RAID controller or a, a storage system that looks like a disk, feels like a disk, but isn't really a disk. Um, you could be familiar with this if you've used LVM and logical volumes. All right, you do LV create the size of your volume, and that's a LUN, right, for convention. A pool. Um, in, in again, in LVM parlance, 
that would be a volume group. All right. And so a pool is made up of a number of disks. All right. A volume is a unit of ma managed storage. It can be a LUN or it can be a file system. It can be just some logical entity that defines some storage array or some storage space. Uh, the vo a volume manager, sorry. Um, this is something like LVM, ZFS, BTRFS. Um, it's a, 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 an amount of software that can help you manage multiple disks in sort of a, a sane way, one hopes. Any questions? Nope, I'll continue. All right, so LVM, um, I'm hoping that a lot of people here have some experience with it. Um, chances are if you installed CentOS or some of the more modern, or I hate to use modern for CentOS, but if, you're, if you use some of the more enterprise-ready Linuxes, uh, they tend to use LVM where they'll put uh, a root file system, LVM volume group on your boot drive and then allocate out of it, All right? LVM, you know, they have the PV display, physical volumes, then you create a volume group and then out of that volume group, you make logical volumes, All right? Uh, with ZFS, it's interesting in that it can do all the things that LVM does. It, it can create logical volumes. It has a pool, everything. Um, but, and this is sort of like a very internal sort of distinction, and I don't want to get too far into it, but LVM manages disk space on the disks themselves. So, they, generally speaking, when you allocate a, a, a logical volume, the logical volume is a fixed entity in, in a system. And when you write to it, you update it. All right. It's, it's in place. It, it's very, it's very static. You know, you write once it, it right. When you write to a block, it writes once and it's done. Um, ZFS is different. Getting used to my mouse. Sorry about that. ZFS is different, and we'll get into this in a second. But ZFS allocates objects out of its pool. Um, it's a it's a lot like the difference between uh, allocating a flat file and and doing operations on a flat file versus um, a database, where your logically contingent uh, contiguous things are scattered all over the place. Um, BTRFS is similar to uh, ZFS, more similar to ZFS than it is LVM. I'm not going to go into it because it's been removed from Red Hat 8. Uh, if it becomes like a major thing, then, you know, it's something we, could we should talk about at some point. Any questions before I move on? Okay. So, ZFS is very interesting in that, unlike LVM, or well, like LVM, it takes all your disks and makes them into a pool. Um, but the pool itself is a file system. So if we want to look at that, I'll look at we can look at my system. So if we go into and you can you can adjust wherever this is mounted. It's a it's a setting in ZFS. So this is my volume, right? These are all just different projects I've worked on. And if you look at what's left, my Z pool here is uh, 17 gig. Or is it 17 gig? No, it's 1.7 gig. Yeah, dash H. All right. Um, what, what was the question? If you try DF dash H, you'll get a human readable. Oh. All right. So it's 1.7 terabytes. All right. So that's just um, my disks. 
But you also notice that I have ZFS, Home, Demo, and Volume 1, Wall 1. These are objects allocated out of the Z pool, and they exist as objects, and they're very similar, and they have the exact same storage size as the Z pool itself. And in ZFS, when we talk about the pool, we talk about the configuration of the pool. Now, this one, um, kind of pay a little attention because this is kind of important. This is my pool. I have three drives in an in array configuration. Each of these drives is... Uh, some number, it might be two terabytes. So this should be four terabytes um, with, with a RAID stripe. Uh, the log file, that is the, th that is the slog. Basically, when you write to ZFS, you don't write in place on the file system. Every time you write, you allocate new blocks out of the pool, update the object, and if there are no other users of that block, that block, the previous block is freed. Remember, please remember this because that's very important in the future. It's not copy on right, it's redirect on, it's like copy on right, but it's redirect on right. Whereas when we write, a new chunk is allocated and inserted into the object. And the old chunk if it has no further references, will be reused. But it could have further references, and we'll get to that in a minute. The cache is just basically a cache. The logs is a write-ahead log that allows ZFS to update the metadata um, securely so you don't lose data. Now, what can we take out of the ZFS pool? Um, first of all, we're not going to go into ZFS internals. Um, this is, it, it can get down really deep, but we can talk about that at some other point if there's interest. So a ZFS object is something you allocate out of ZFS. Um, inside ZFS, uh, like I said in LVM, LVM is more of a static allocation. Is anyone familiar with uh, LVM and how it stores data? With disk manager. Raise hands? No? Okay. So generally speaking, um, you statically define a range in your ZFS volume group. And when you do reads and writes, you update that range of storage. When you write to block 500, every time you write to block 500, you update that particular block in the storage. ZFS is different. Like I said, every time you write to block 100, a new block is allocated out of the pool and replaced into a Merkle tree that represents the object. All right. Sorry, the, the scrolling on my mouse is doing the wrong thing. So all this is all this is the the complicated stuff, complicated upfront sort of concepts we need to deal with. ZFS, like I said, represents objects as file systems or block devices, but they are not like LVM where they're allocated out of a range. They really just look like a hierarchy of blocks. Does anyone need any more information? Any more about that? Or are we are we good? So you're saying when they say pool, they're not kidding. Correct. So it's just a storage, it's just a bunch of storage blocks. Right. And when you create an object, the top level, there's a top level hash. It contains a number of block references. When that object grows, it will split and get and, and become a tree until it can grow into ungodly sizes. 
all right? A small object, very few blocks, very internal, very few internal blocks. Uh, that, you know, terabyte objects can have multiple blocks. Now, a lot of people don't use this, but it was a selling point at one, po one point with ZFS where blocks could be reused in the form of dedupe. All right, because since an object is represented by a tree of blocks, there's no reason why you couldn't have the same block that's a duplicate in multiple entries in that tree. So you can dedupe. But nobody uses that anymore because it's very memory intensive and very inefficient. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide unless anyone has. Deduplication being ZFS worst implementation feature. I get that. Um, then app and sun sales elements. Yeah, this is all we're all in Linux uh, open source. So has everyone got this this conceptual stuff down before we go to the next slide? Okay, next. Now, like I said, a ZFS system looks like a common Linux file system. So in here we can do mkdir test. Of course, I don't have that. Oh, it looks just like a file system. This is actually the top of the pool, which is kind of helpful because if you if you're used to LVM, you can't really do that, right? You have to allocate a, a volume format it and put a file system on it. Next thing is Zvols. I touched upon them briefly. And a Zvol is a block device. All right. It, it looks like a block device. You can allocate partitions out of it. You can even set your, if you put ZFS in your init RAMFS, you can even boot off a ZFS Zvol and um, so you can use it as an L1. Right? One of the cool things about ZFS that you really can't do uh, with LVM that you can do with ZFS is you can allocate volumes sparsely, which means that if you can you can allocate a two terabyte volume, and it'll take up no initial space until it's used. So if I um, Error. Okay. So I just created a two terabyte volume called Big Zvol. And my free space hasn't changed. That's because the Zvol is there. I can put a file system on it. That's just creating a, a very big file system on a very, very empty LUN. Um, if this were LVM, I probably wouldn't be able to do it because I don't actually have enough disk space to do it. But this will create a, a, a file system that looks like a four terabyte file system, acts like a four terabyte, terabyte file system, 
and will sort of crash when you fill up your hard disk, when you fill up your space. All right. Now's the fun part. You remember we talked about how objects are basically represented by a tree. The interesting thing about the tree that they are represented by is that they are a loosely based tree and they are linked by cryptographic hashes. Right? Um, anyone who wants to can uh, do a, a search for a Merkle tree on um, Wikipedia. But basically, the, the, the hashes, the blocks themselves are loosely based. There's no there's no refer there's no reference based pointer to blocks. There is a cryptographic hash reference to blocks. So an object is nothing more than a series of cryptographic hashes. All right, and links to cryptographic hashes, which means that every time you update a block, the cryptographic hash of the higher up block changes and so forth. So now we have that. So we now have this mount temp that is four terabytes. Notice that it's bigger than the ZFS Z pool. And that's because it's allocated uh, sparsely. The only space it takes up in the Z pool is what's actually been right. Everything else will just return zeros when you try to read it. And these are all various volumes. Um, you know, what's used and where's my, where's Big Z Vol? And Big Z Vol here. We're only taking up 368 megabytes. All right. Even though it reports itself to be four terabytes. Now this is, now here's the fun part. We're into... Got something. Let's make some. Let's um. Let's DD something. We're gonna put random data on this. Um. You have a blocking random. I know. We have we have that. That's a nice piece of data. So what I did is just create a snapshot. A snapshot basically makes a duplicate reference to the top level uh, of the Merkle tree. Now, notice, if you will, that even though I made a snapshot, no much space has changed. We didn't duplicate what was used. We only we only duplicated a reference to it. Now, if I go back into now, I have two blocks in there of random data. Now, if I were to
in the snapshots on my system. <laughs> right? We see um, Big Z ball Ridge. It's using 346K, um, and it refers to a 37 megabyte wide. So what, what we have here now is we have the previous version of the disk that just has that one data set, whereas ZVOL itself has two data, data sets. Now, they reference the same data. They share the data. The only difference is the live volume has the additional data. So we don't duplicate anything. We are just basically making a reference copy. All right. And the snapshot, like I said, is a read-only representation of a ZFS object. All right. Um, it's just a copy of the Merkle tree. It's effectively a copy of the Merkle tree. Um, it cannot be changed. It's read-only. It has the data. You can use it for long-term backups because it is so lightweight. Um, it shares the blocks with the object that it's a snapshot of. Um, and you can have thousands of snapshots. My previous company that got bought by Actifio, we used ZFS to basically maintain thousands of snapshots, point-in-time recoveries uh, for years on end. Right? And um, ZFS is great in that when, you read when it reads data off the disk, it checksums the data that it re that reads and can test whether it's valid or not. Now, clone is an interesting thing. Now, say we have, say we just did something stupid. We, we deleted a file. We all like to do stupid things, right? Let's uh, mount. Here's our data. It's all good in there. We just deleted an important file. Oh my God, I've been working on that for a week. All right, what do we do? Well, this is cool. Now, if I don't have test that data, All right? So the snapshots are very lightweight. You could probably run a snapshot every hour on your computer. All right. And if you ever just delete something by accident, you could probably just get it back from a clone whenever you, whenever you want. And to prove that, uh, 6A1437. And here we go. 6A1437, that's the file we deleted. It's there, we can copy it back to temp. We can even revert um, the data if we want, but that would lose subsequent changes. So a, a clone creates a usable volume from a snapshot, right? Um, this volume is also read-write.
give my spelling. So the clone sits in front of the snapshot and when it doesn't have anything in its own Merkle tree, all right, it defaults to the snapshot Merkle tree. And the snapshot Merkle tree defaults to the original object Merkle tree. So data, data is very sparsely used here. We're not duplicating a lot. If I were to copy test.data back to my original, I would probably end up making a duplicate copy because I don't have ddp enabled. But that is what it is. Now, we've just gone through some of the basics. And the question is, how do you use that for anything useful? This is sort of like out of our Actifio playbook, but it's um, common knowledge. Um, this slide is here for, is everyone familiar how to set up SSH with passwordless connectivity? This is a very quiet group. Nobody's asking questions. So we're we using have... Mute like good people. Yeah, that's right. the way we access the BLU server. It's all through RSA keys yeah. and SSH. Well, you should switch to elliptic curve. But... Who said that? Is there a reason that you didn't use the uh, .zfs file system to access the previous snapshot? Um. Yes, because it's a Z vault. I had to do a clone. And these snapshots don't show up in the ZFS. Oh, oh that's right. You you made it an X4FS on top of it. Oh. So. And two VMs here. Uh, we had a pretty interesting discussion last week about how useful VMs were. So, actually, love VMs. So, of course, SSH, MO2, works. We have a shared key, all that. Um, beyond the scope of this particular meeting, but it's all set up. Now, we've done a little of this. We have zpool. I've got a zpool created. It's based on VDB. VDB is, oh, that's the fun part. I'm using KVM on my Linux system to create two VMs, uh, demo one. And these are just basically files that I've uh, put on my ZFS uh, file system. And this is one of my uh, favorite tricks where I just touch a file, truncate it to the size that I want, and put a file system on it. I'll put a VM on it. All right. So we have two VMs here, demo one, demo two. Let's go. And we're going, let's, let's delete this demo. I think one of those days you just can't type. Most of most days. Right, so we have no pools. It's empty. Let's create one. Uh, there is a drive called VDB on this system. Um, it was created just by using um, touch and truncate. Yeah. So th this command here, zpool create, the A shift is interesting. ZFS. It might be different now than later versions, but older ZFS defaulted to a 
512 byte block size. Um, even though some hard disks today still advertise a 512 byte block size, they're all 4K. Make the internal block size that we allocate 4K. We have our pool. Um, I think I'm already get this directory open. We're going to create a file system that we're going to mount, not as evolve a file system. All right, um, and we're going to use compression because why wouldn't you? Right, so now we have no. If we check the mount point. Do that. We see that deep pool devil is mounted on devil. Let's create the destination pool for fun. Do the same thing. Um, someone mentioned that you can see the snapshots in the hidden.cfs directory in each mount point. Um, I'm not sure I was aware of that. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but you can also list them with a uh, FT snapshots, and you can make them visible by default with a setting. And so now we're going to do the same thing on this side. So we only need to create the pool itself because the pool is not going to be serving anything. We are going to be using it as a replication target. Let's create a snapshot of our, our pool. Now we're going to send this over to the ZFS. I hope that doesn't break much. No, didn't of course. We have now created our pool on the other side. Now, this sounds kind of mundane, kind of sad, but it's very interesting what we can do now. We're going to do this nice new thing, make some data. So it's there, it's nice. Nothing's there. 
Now we're gonna do the fun stuff. Now we create a, a separate snapshot. Two snapshots listed. I don't see a, a hidden .zfs directory. That might probably be a setting. So now we're going to send our snapshot over again. But the difference this time, if you'll notice, that we give the previous snapshot on the send command. So what this does is this does a diff between the two Merkle trees, the snapshot one Merkle tree and the snapshot two Merkle tree. And whatever's newer, whatever's not already there will be sent. We just sent basically the diffs between the, the previous snapshot and this new snapshot. So no matter how much data you have in this hard disk, the only thing that's going to be changed, the only thing that's going to be sent is the difference between the two snapshots. So you could have terabytes of data. And if you've only had 50 megabytes of change, you'll only spend, send 50 megabytes over. And as you can see here, that's data. And if we do it's the same. So it's a very, very simple thing, but what we've actually done is we've done an incremental backup and resulted with a full backup right so there's no uh date time whatever our two snapshots on this side too right so and we could we could we could continue to do this every single hour, every single day or whatever for as long as you want. And the only overhead that you would have of the snapshot is um, the metadata that keeps track of the change blocks. So this is a very efficient way to have a full backup done every night by only setting up the change blocks. There's no tarring, there's no um, tarring up your whole terabyte of Oracle data, you're only going to send the stuff that's changed since the two snapshots. And I'm not going to go into it in this, but if we want to keep snap one and snap two as constants, you would destroy the old snap one, right? You would rename the, the, the new snap two to snap one, and you do the same thing on the demo system, on the on the destination system. And that way you'd always be doing the dip between snap one and snap two. But you don't have to do it that way. Um, and this is a simple script that you could run every night that would just, in perpetuity, send your data to a replication server or a replication target and you would have the equivalent of a full backup every night. And one of the cool things about ZFS, um, and I will say off the bat, there are a lot of things that I really dislike about ZFS. Um, and, have, and having crawled around internal on the internals, uh, I'm not entirely happy with how it's developed. There's, um, in version seven, there was a lock in version issue with Linux that you would occasionally hit once in a while. They, as far as to my knowledge, they haven't gotten rid of this problem. They've only guarded better against it um, because there's a, a slight difference between the way BSD 
does file operations and, and ZFS. So I have problems with ZFS in general, but I like the way it does everything on the user on the user space level. I think it does everything you would want a volume manager to do. All right. So this simple script, send your data snapshot, send your data, you know, delete the oldest snapshot, rename the newest snapshot, and do the same thing on the target side. And you could do this every night and have a complete and full usable backup of your daily work and only send the change blocks. And that and that to me, a lot I see I see a lot of people still doing, you know, full tar, full whatever. And you can enable you can enable compression on these disks so you can save space. Our snapshot does similar type of thing. Our, um, our snapshot for Z Oracle, right? For Linux. What's our snapshot? It's a uh, Perl script that's included in most Linux systems for doing backups. It does snapshots, and it uses rsync to uh, essentially send over only blocks that have changed. All right. So the problem with rsync, the problem with rsync is that to know what blocks have changed, um, it has to go through all the blocks on both sides and compare the, the checksums of the blocks. And yep. so it's faster. ZFS doesn't have to do that. ZFS has all the change blocks in its list. And so it's really much faster than rsync. Um, I would agree. All right. There's also uh, some change block drivers that you can use with LVM or uh, Disk Manager. Um, and they're good. Um, but they're limited to LVM volumes. Right. And um, LVM snap snapshots are interesting. Um, Disk Manager itself is a lot more capable than LVM, but I don't think many people uh, dig as deeply into LVM um, as in Disk Manager as they could, and they're just satisfied to stay at the, the top of LVM system. So when you take a snapshot on LVM, what you're doing is you're creating um, basically um, a series of extents in your in your disk pool or your volume group, and I forget the size of it, but there's it pre-allocates a chunk, and then LVM snapshots are copy on write. So when you update a block in an LVM original, the data that was there previously is now copied to your snapshot. If you have multiple snapshots, every write to your original volume that uh, that changes a block, all right, gets pushed out to each and every snapshot. So LVM snapshots can be very expensive if you have multiple ones hanging around. And you can do something very similar to this um, on LVM by keeping one live snapshot each time. So you can do a snapshot in LVM, do another snapshot in LVM, and you can look if you, the, the doc, the, the format of the um, snapshot is is something that's knowable. It's it's in the kernel um, source, and it basically has a header, and then all the blocks in a was is sort of thing. And you can get the change blocks out of the LVM snapshots, but ZFS uh, with the Merkle tree <coughs> sort of has that already. And if you want to take a look, we can do. How hard would it be to do uh, ZFS uh, the ZFS uh, type backups using uh, Amazon S3 storage as the uh, as the remote backup server? Okay, so it's a very interesting question. Um, the problem is that the ZFS backup assumes that the receiver 
is a ZFS formatted system and can understand the snapshots. All right. Um, you You're can much do required. it. Yeah. All right. So I'll show you. I'll show you a way to do it if you're interested. Because because if if the humble uh, developer wants to try this, I've actually this was one of my original prototypes that I did for Actifio way back a long time ago. So let's see. Here we go. This is ZDB. ZDB is your friend. If you really want to explore ZFS. All right. Remember how I told, told you about a Merkle tree? This is basically dumping the Merkle tree. We have an L5 hash, L4, whatever, and L, these are all the, this is all the hierarchy of the tree. L5 is on this the highest. There's an L4, L3, L2, L1, and one block here, and one block here. All right. And those then point to the, L, the L0 now points to these blocks in the pool. This information, this is the offset into the object. These are the checksums. And I forget off the top of my head, but there's a way to convert this information. Live streaming is on. OK. So the question was, can we ZFS, use ZFS to replicate to an S3 system? And the answer to that is yes, but it's not as easy as one would hope. So using ZDB, we can dump out the effective tree of a snapshot. And we can do that for each snapshot. And you'll see this snapshot has the same L L5, L4, L3 hierarchy. It has it has a bunch of blocks allocated. Now, I don't know. If, I don't remember off the top of my head how I did this, but in here, there is uh, a findable block. So you can take you can write a small differ that can look at this information and do a diff and basically get that block out of ZFS and pass it up to S3. So if you were to do this, what I would say is I would create a not a file system, but a, 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 a block device like a Zvol, all right? And use ZDB and snapshots to send the change blocks for that block device to S3, the S3 bucket. That's just off the top of my head. I mean, it's something you could, we'd have to figure out. But, but you can you can find the blocks in Zvol that have been modified between two snapshots. You can extract the data from the snapshot you want, and you could write that to the S3 bucket. Uh, the implementation is up to the humble reader. All right. So I didn't want to get too much into the internals. I mean, it's, it's always fun to, to go down that road, but uh, this is really about backing up um, in forever. So like I said, snapshots are really, really lightweight. Um, a snapshot of whatever volume is only really taking up uh, And some of these are shared. If 
this block will be shared. So if you see it, it's A033, whatever. Uh, blocks will be shared. The snapshots only take up space on the changed blocks. So you can have as many snapshots as you want. Um, you could do um, a snapshot every hour, you know, and then just save a day's worth of snapshot, delete the old ones. Um, you could do a snapshot every month, every year, every quarter, and keep them around. And as long as your replication target is secure, um, you have a good long backup that's easy to use, very secure. ZFS checksums and checks every single block uh, that it reads. You know, unlike RAID, where you can have silent corruption or RAID and not even know how many people have an MP3 collection that suddenly skips after a while because there was a block that changed. Well, in ZFS, that block would be detected and you'd see a checksum error. And you'd know that that happened. Um, and a lot of people uh, used Actifio software as um, long-term uh, storage for corporate governance, right? So they could go back to a particular point in time and say, yes, we know we backed this up on the day before that operation, and this was the state of what we had. So you can keep that around. Um, like I said, they only return, retain change blocks. You can have you can have thousands of these. And we I in my company we've tested tens of thousands of snapshots in a pool and the, the snapshots the snapshots themselves don't seem to impact performance. But if you had a clone for every snapshot that would kind of swamp UDiv at boot up boot time trying to instantiate all those Zvols at startup. If you have it, you'd have thousands of block devices and no one would want that. All right. Um, they're good. Snapshots are, aren't just for backup. They're, they're good for, um, like I said, disaster recovery. They can be used for clones. You could create, so for instance, say you have a very, very large Oracle database, tens, you know, a terabyte of, of data, and you want to use that for test and dev. You can take a snapshot of your Oracle data, clone it, and now you have a full copy of your huge Oracle database that you can spin up a new Oracle instance and access. All right, because it's just a clone. It's it's you're using a snapshot that's lightweight, and you're using a clone. And the point in time that you took that snapshot is the database that you can use for test and dev. You can. Um, you can create a series of VMs. Say you need 100 VMs that all do the same thing, right? You can do. You can make one VM snapshot and clone it 100 times, and then when you're done, just delete, delete all the clones. And so, this is an example. You want action recovery. You can take a snapshot every 15 minutes, right, on a cron job. And of course, you might want to write a script or something to clean up after overnight and all that kind of stuff. And you'd never, you'd never lose more than 15 minutes worth of data. You'd always be able to get it back. As long as it's saved, you're good. All right. And you wouldn't see much effect on performance at all. Um, like I said, you can use it as, as a historical archive. You can do it in once a week, once a month, um, whatever is important. If you're a law office, you might want to take a snapshot and give something for discovery or whatever. It's there. Uh, you can do it by release dates. You can do it by anything that's important to you. And of course, you can replicate. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, if you took 100, um, if you want to make 100 um, VM instances, you could install one, get it the way you like, take a snapshot and clone it 100 times. It's not updatable because 
you're not updating the snapshots, the snapshots are immutable, but it can save a lot of time if you want something quick and early. All, for all the people yawning out there, I'm almost done. Um, you can do a larger scale backup. As you saw in the demo, um, we were able to easily replicate the snapshots only by change blocks. Well, if everyone on their laptop had a ZVOL, a, a ZFS implementation, and, and their home directories were slash laptop 1A or 1B, you could use this replication strategy to replicate every single laptop every night. And it would only be the changes. And that's it. Done. Open for questions. Thank you. I think it's an excellent presentation. Any uh, any questions? Any uh, any really deep questions that anyone's curious about? Is it fairly simple to set up a uh, set of ZFS on a laptop? Yeah, um, uh, it's it's well. What what version of Linux are you using? A Fedora. What's the latest? Thirty-five or thirty-six? That's interesting. Does Fedora have ZFS internally? I know Ubuntu does. I'm not really sure. Right, but um, it's easy to set it up if if it's part of the operating system. I mean, I, I don't know how how hackerish you guys still are. I, I have lost my patience for doing a lot of this stuff outside of work. Um, so Ubuntu just comes with it, and it puts the ZFS modules in the init RAMFS. So you can use ZFS as your boot, your your home volumes, or root volume. Jabber, so, you might want to investigate uh, ButterFS and do similar things with that. Yeah, Since you know, Fedora comes with. ButterFS. Is it? I know. I know they took it out of Red Hat Enterprise. Yes, is, they did. Um, how does that bode for um, Fedora? Is Fedora's learn sort of like test and try to get it to prove itself, or do we think that it's going to go the way to, of Riser FS? Well, yeah, but Hans uh, killed his wife. I know. <laughs> you know, and and, and um, Larry Ellison killed son. So, well, that's true too. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I I don't know. Uh, I think it does not bode well the future of ButterFS. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you need you need a modern system. Yeah. You know, ext. Four is a decent uh, file system, but ZFS is a better enterprise class system than Butter than AXD4. And I don't know if ButterFS is ready for uh, enterprise yet, or ever will be. I, having been in the enterprise space now for about a decade. I'm not impressed with things that claim to be enterprise ready. Yep. Um, but uh, but like I said, I I have I've been working with ZFS for a while, and I, it's what I trust. I, I I have really come to trust it. We were um, I can't give you specifics because it's under embargo, but ZFS can find things that. A lot of other systems just can't. All right. Um, for instance, there was, uh, I don't know, about five years ago, a major, major hard drive manufacturer had a firmware bug, all right, in, in their systems where under the right circumstances, the last 12 bytes of a write would be lost. All right. Um, 
we found it with our product uh, using ZFS um, and, uh, and our DDU system. Like I said, we were under embargo. We couldn't, we can't talk about it, but suffice to say the industry got firmware updates after they figured out what it was after we said, why are we getting checksum errors? Why is, why is, why are our pools getting corrupted? All right. And you, you don't see that with regular RAID, you know, regular RAID just reads and says, okay, here it is. Um, but ZFS reads, checks the checksum and says, oh, this isn't right. And so um, if you care about your data, um, I won't say that ZFS is the fastest file system out there, but I would say it's the most secure. And believe me, I'm not trying to sell ZFS. I hate the internals. <laughs> uh, I just took a quick look at Fedora and it's not on the Fedora distribution. Yeah. So, so you have to add it. You will probably have to go to ZFS on Linux.org. Yeah. Download it. You may need to build it. Um, then you, if you want to boot off it, you'll need to use something like Drakeit to recalculate your init RAMFS mm -hmm. to put the drivers and make the drivers available at boot time. So I'm going to stop sharing unless anyone else has anything else. No. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I really liked it. Oh, thank you. And if there's interest, I can do an internal talk here at some point. Yeah, Mark, can you send me a copy of the slides so I can post on the blue web server? Yeah, I have a PDF I can mail you. Okay, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay. All right, so what do I do now? So I guess we're pretty much done. Unless, uh, unless people want to talk uh, about other things. No, I'm going to go uh, have dinner with my wife. <laughs> okay. All right, catch you all later. It was fun. See you. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Right. Bye. Yeah, bye. I think if I wanted to set up an infrastructure with ZFS, the easiest thing to do uh, would be start by switching to Ubuntu. You can do that. Unless you insist on ZFS on root, uh, Debian is quite as easy as Ubuntu uh, with the exception of one more command, apt install ZFS. <laughs>